All right, this is the uh, fourth session of asset-based assessment series. Um, this is the final one. And so uh, to get us started, um, we wanted to uh, go ahead and give Nate um, a few minutes to kind of uh, remind us where we've been and lead us into this final session. Yeah, this is a, an exciting day, uh, the kind of conclusion of this four workshop series, um, focused on asset-based assessment. Those of you uh, that have missed any of the sessions, either this year or last year, um, that, that is definitely Thor's hammer, uh, Joanna, no doubt. Um, I think Jeremy actually took this picture. Is that right, Jeremy? I'm sorry. I'm not that good. No. Um... <laughs> I, I have been um, in the winter and done that hike, and um, but I did not take this picture either. However, okay. if you do go back and look for each of the four series, I did use um, Google stock photographs and I looked for Utah-based scenes and each of them is different. So uh, that's just a little subtle nod in the background. So thank you for noticing. <laughs> Thank you for making it a little less subtle, Patrick. We appreciate that less than subtle nod. And uh, though I think uh, Utah has an identity for, for recognizing uh, its own kind of special places. So I definitely noted that and appreciated it. Um, so if you haven't been at all the sessions, um, I think in, for the last session, it's worth kind of revisiting our uh, kind of collective progression that, that has happened um, since roughly uh, August of last year. Um, and just to highlight a few things that I've seen today uh, at the Utah Council of Teachers and Mathematics Conference that are a reflection of some of the work that, that you all have done, um, both with stakeholders and, and within your own purview uh, connected to this asset-based practice. So um, we had a, a kind of three-day intensive last year uh, focused around that broad vision of asset-based practices and making sense of how systems could incorporate uh, like honoring students' assets in ways uh, that were either implicitly or explicitly not happening um, to some of the systems we were connected to. And in some cases that was intentional and in other, other cases it was absolutely unintentional. So that, that kind of three-day workshop last year kind of led us to um, zoom in a little bit on one particular aspect of asset-based practice, which is our four workshop series for this year, uh, the asset-based assessments. Um, and so throughout uh, our time together this year, and our four workshops, or three workshops, uh, four and counting, um, we have we have kind of dissected the idea of assessments um, and how we can leverage both assessments that already exist, as well as build um, new assessment and reporting mechanisms that allow us to to kind of again both implicitly and or explicitly um, like focus on. A student's assets and the things that they bring uh, to a conversation as a starting point for their growth in order to meet learning goals. Um, and, and so uh, as we, we talked about more in depth uh, two sessions ago, oftentimes assessments as they're built now are, are focused around gaps and they're focused on identifying what students don't know. And there's all kinds of uh, opportunity costs that come from assessment systems that are designed in that way. So um, we kind of co-created together during our, um, our last two sessions uh, a framework of sorts that allows us both to start looking at uh, the, the assessments themselves, because as, as this question has come up several times with, within our conversation, is any assessment asset-based or is, is an assessment an assessment that can make it easier to use the, the data that comes from that, the information that comes from that assessment in an asset-based way. Um, and, and so uh, we have like co-created this framework that helps us build both assessments and reports that set us up for success in identifying what students know uh, at like first in that chronology. As we've talked about uh, in other sessions, the goal here isn't to just ignore things that students don't know. The goal is is to start with uh, honoring what students do know as uh, a kind of um, like first like step in a, in a pathway of honoring um, or, like or building those 
that, those pieces of knowledge into um, whatever our learning targets for the day are. So, um, so today we're going, we're going to kind of complete this work connected to uh, this framework that we built and reports that you use uh, said framework with last time in order to, um, I guess, to kind of like look at the entire system holistically. How can we build a system of uh, asset-based assessment that uh, is, is kind of wieldly and um, adaptable regardless of, of the content that you're focused on. Um, and, and this is true both within like educational means, thinking about within classrooms, but as we talked about uh, with our reporting conversation, especially last time, this is also true in uh, circumstances where we're looking at a statewide system, that there's all kinds of assessments that we use that aren't student-based assessments, but rather systems-based assessments in some way. And, and the principles and the, even the framework that we built uh, are applicable to these circumstances as well. So uh, without further ado, um, our, our last uh, couple hour workshop, uh, let's, let's get her into gear. Patrick, you first or Jeremy, someone, whoever can take over who is ready. Well, let me just transition and then hand it to Jeremy. This is roughly our uh, agenda. Again, <clears throat> the feedback we got from the previous sessions, we read it all and take it to heart. Um, one of the things everyone really appreciated is that time to uh, really uh, collaborate and um, talk to your peers. Um, and in a meeting like this, where people are from a lot of different departments or areas or disciplines, um, we know that that doesn't always happen. So we've structured this similar to the last ones where we will be talking, um, kind of framing this final question about action. And then we'll have sort of two scenarios that will put you into breakout rooms where you can talk about your own ideas, experiences, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's roughly, and then we'll kind of wrap it all up right at the end. So uh, that's the plan for today. And um, here you go. All right. So uh, yeah, as we've been reflecting, there's, it started with asset-based assessment, we talked about asset-based reporting, and now, great, we can have all those things. What do we do about it? So we're going to approach asset-based action. And uh, so here you can see this is just a, a rewind um, back to the beginning, right? Uh, you know, is asset-based versus asset-based just half glass empty or half full distinction? One of the big things is it all really depends, right? What is your goal and what do you have? If your goal is to fill this cup, Maybe you have a half glass full. If your goal is to empty this cup, uh, or you have, may have a half glass empty, right? Um, it all really does depend um, on the context um, in 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 how you frame it. Um, so you can go ahead, Patrick. So um, this uh, this was Patrick's uh, preparation for a week long wilderness camping trip, uh, and if you talk about supplies. Right, uh, you can come at it from this lens of well, we don't have this and we don't have that and we don't have whatever, right? Or we can come at it from well, let's start with what we do have and what kind of trip that we value, right? One um, one trip doesn't necessarily look like another. What do we what do we want our trip to look like, and what do we have already? And then we can talk about well, what do we um, want to get in order to make this trip the thing that we want. So just a summary, right? Uh, what do you have to work with to accomplish your goal, right? And what else would help accomplish that goal? And you build up on all of those to progress towards it. We'll go to the next one. <clears throat> so yeah, assets are defined and only makes sense relative to the, a clearly articulated goal. So that's gonna be a big theme um, in, in how you actually work towards something. We need to deeply understand what we're working towards in order to make that progress. So just uh, one last uh, fun example, right? Are these assets a blender and shoes? Maybe, what are we doing? If we're baking a cake, blender is a great, asset. If we're running a race, shoes are a great asset. If you're running a race, a blender could be a terrible asset. Uh, I don't know, you know, I'm not much of a marathon runner, but 
running with a blender seems like it would be a lot harder. So we have to, you know, look at, well, what are we trying to do? Why is this, you know, is this useful to us? What do we want? Um, that could mean, you know, in this running race example, we want shoes and we want to get rid of a blender, right? Or vice versa. It really does depend. All right. So asset-based action. Number one, number one thing we got to do. What is our goal? Let's clearly articulate it. What are we trying to get to? Number two, what assets are currently available to you? What do you have? What resources do you have? What skill sets do you have? What connections or people um, are in place to help you, right? Um, have you, is there experience in the past? Is there references to um, that somebody else has done this, right? Has an expert solved your problem already and you can utilize them, right? Like really think broadly, what assets do you have currently available to you? That can look like physical things. It can look like monetary, financial. It can look like expertise, people, you know, time, labor, all of those things, um, you know, are assets that could be available to you in reference to your goal. Number three, right? What do you need to learn, obtain, create? And I actually didn't do the negatives here. Uh, could be, uh, you know, unlearn, get rid of, destroy, right? In order to, to reach that goal, right? So you're gonna then kind of think about it from, from that point of view. And right, finally, I, I, would, I would say that in terms of negative, I mean, sometimes to reach a goal, you need to remove an obstacle or get around it. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do, where you currently are. Um, and sometimes that might remain, re mean getting rid of something or trying to take something out of the way. Right. Uh, and then utilizing from number two, right? Well, what assets do you, can you leverage to get what you need and to reach that goal? So this is kind of the general framing we're going to have around how to define, uh, you know, what action we're going to take from an asset-based lens. Uh, is there any questions or comments uh, thus far? All right. Well. Uh, Patrick is now going to introduce a scenario for you. And then we're going to, um, shortly after that, jump into some breakout rooms and think about our own asset-based action um, based on these things, just uh, that, that getting into practice of the things that we want to do in the future. Great. Right. So some of the impetus of this was um, the last session. I was in a really interesting breakout session where there was a lot of discussion about um, the idea of even what is the nature of the report? What is this data telling us? Can we trust it? Um, and so the sort of scenario is that if you have a goal and you're trying to um, see either progress or what you've made towards this goal, you know, one of the interesting things about I think the asset-based framework is that a lot of times when you look at, for example, gaps or deficit-based analysis, uh, you know, you have a goal like students can, you know, read at a, you know, at a certain level, and then you report out that these students are not reading at that level. That's the data you're working with. How does that help you? Like, how are you building off that? Um, I always make the joke um, that my family makes fun of me because they say that I act like a professor and will go into these long-winded lectures and they'll interrupt me and they say, could you be more interesting, please? And, uh, you know, I feel like that sort of feedback is pretty deficit-based and not really building on what I'm trying to do. And I think sometimes by just reporting out what's missing, like we've said in all these scenarios, you have that. But in this case, there's a really interesting thing that we wanted to pick up, and that is that sometimes you actually have some data, but the data that you have 
you question whether it's really capturing the information you want or you don't even trust the um, the data to begin with. Uh, last time we talked about reporting and one of the big themes of that is the interrogating, if you will, you know, where did this data come from? How was it collected? What was it done? And so what we wanted to do in this sort of last session about actions is we wanted to have a breakout where you could think of a real life example that you've dealt with recently where you had a clear goal. Um, maybe it was reading or literacy. Maybe it was a goal um, in social studies or the arts or mathematics. Um, it, whatever it was, you had a goal, you have, or you have a goal. And then what you want to do is query the data that you have and sort of leverage this. Again, think of that slide where we're talking about what is the data we have? How do we uh, act on that data to move forward to determine what we want to do this? And again, I wanna start by just sharing something that Jeremy and I came across very recently that really uh, surprised both of us. And I, you know, I'm not going to call this company out by name, but effectively many companies do this. And it was a mathematics assessment. And so if you wanna say your goal is say sort of meeting standards or grade level standards, that's often like a high level, big picture goal. This report actually reported out whether students were at grade level or one year below grade level or potentially two or more years below grade level, which, you know, you could already start to question, what does that really mean? Do I trust this data? So if a, I have a seventh grade student and this assessment, the data is telling me the students two or more grades below grade level or two grades below, so they're bringing in some sort of level of fifth grade math. Well, and this is absolutely true. We had kindergarten students being classified as two grades below grade level. So that raised some red flags for us. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and this is a real life scenario where what does that mean? And if we really want to talk about, well, what are the standards or what are we, you know, and, and for those of you in early education, and, and I won't go into the details, but in mathematics, there's some really nice, clear goals for what kindergartners, all kindergartners should be able to think about and know mathematically. Um, so what does it mean to be two grade levels below is something that we were really surprised at. We wondered what that meant. I mean, is should that kindergartner be like kicked out, sent back to preschool? I don't know. I mean, so uh, the those are the sort of things that I want you to spend a little time because I assume that all of you have been in situation where you have some goals in your discipline, area, department, whatnot. You have some data and you wanna really try to figure out how this fits into this arc asset-based assessment, the data, the reporting, and then the action. And so right now, the scenario is really stepping back and looking at, is the data that you have actionable? Why or why not? Are there questions you have about the validity of it or even the meaning of it? Where did it come from? How are they determining what does it mean for a kindergartner to be two grade levels below? So. Um, this could be in any of your uh, disciplines. We're going to give you some time in breakouts, and then we'll bring you back together to sort of share out. And again, the sort of what we're asking for is think about a situation in your current work where you have some sort of well-defined or well-defined-ish goal. Um, what kind of data do you have and how actionable is it? And what would make it more, you know, interrogate the or question the data you have in terms of this actionability. So, um, Nate, this is a question we didn't pre-plan. Uh, in the past, we've sort of let people just get into groups. Um, I think for this exercise, it, it could, you know, people we have, I mean, how many people do we have right now? Looks like we have 12 plus 
Nate, you and I, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, we could probably do like three groups of four. Cool. Uh, and and ran it sounds like you were heading towards random. Patrick is okay. Random's fine. I don't. Great. I don't think. I think we actually want people to talk to people from different areas to share out some of their, you know, goals and actionable data in their own personal experiences or, you know, lack of actionability and then unpack that a little. So let me stop sharing. Yeah, like I said, in the example that we just recently had in a, in a math assessment, it legitimately, what does that mean? How do you act on that data that, <laughs> that these kindergartners are already multiple years behind? Um, I mean, um, not, to, not to bring down the vibe, but I actually had an, I was working with uh, an elementary school and one of the teachers told me on the very first day of class, a little girl came up and said, I'm not very good at math. This is kindergarten, day one of school, first time ever. <laughs> I mean, how, you know, that just, I think is so sad that that would already be something that had been processed. So again, um, yeah, I'm trying not to make this into a downer thing. We're really interested in including successes that you've had or challenges, but this is about a specific example that you've had or recently had. Cool. Um, Jeremy or Patrick, could you see about creating breakout rooms? I'm on my iPad and I am struggling to make it work on my end. <laughs> sure. I. Uh, I'm pretty um, sure Patrick and I are both pretty bad at this, but uh, we. I can try. Um, uh, if you want to make me a co-host, I'll do the breakout rooms. Oh, I've also lost my status as co-host. Oh, maybe that's why. Melissa, thank oh. you. <laughs> um, I just need to be. Oh, there I'm a co-host. Okay. Yeah, Jody, mm -hmm. unleash the mama bear. Why is it not allowing me to make breakout rooms? Everyone in this group kind of knows. Like I have I have a really strong mama bear instinct. You don't mess with my cubs. <laughs> and by telling a five-year-old they're multiple years behind like it's triggering my mama bear it's not good uh i am not showing that there's an option to create breakout rooms yeah i i'm getting i'm the, i'm in the same boat melissa i'm not totally sure why that is happening mm -hmm. and i don't know how to fix it i've uh, never seen that happen before well i've never had it happen <laughs> <laughs> let's see i'm certainly no authority but like there's 12 of us right that's that is just kind of start <laughs> that's um, <laughs> if, if uh if someone's got something let's get started and yeah let's start and you know worst case and worst you know we might have to just have some group discussions but please get us started and we'll i'll continue to tinker a little to see if i can get something happening but please could, start could you put that list of that list you just had up to kind of help us frame our thoughts yeah right. you bet i can also put in the chat i'm happy to get started if nobody else wants to go first yeah. um so i'm working with the universities and we have been sharing their data on foundations of reading. So I'm over I'm incorporating the science of reading in the universities, making sure that that's happening. So I've been trying to frame it as positively as possible. I'm sure they think of me as the dentist, like they just hate it when I show up because they know I'm bringing data. But um, we've shared with them, like all together, their foundations of reading um, passing rates, if, if 
there was a cut score and we've also shared with them their Acadian data. So the, the teachers who graduated from each university, how well their students are doing. So, so we shared it and I'm hoping a positive way. I, I just shared it and I was like, I wanna know what you guys are doing. Those of you that have shown growth from last year, I wanna know how you're doing that. I want this to be a collective efficacy where we're working together and sharing ideas. So anyway, that's kind of how I framed it and how I shared it. So if anyone has any ideas for how to not, for me to not feel like the dentist every time we get together, but um, I feel like the assets that we have are, there are a couple of really um, bright lights. And so I'm trying to focus on those um, schools and find out what they're doing and, and then just sharing that with other schools that are struggling. So, so to frame it, you are, you work with universities on their like teacher programs, the teachers graduate, then work in the schools, and then you're sharing back the achievements that those teachers have had uh, with the goal of understanding what good uh, teaching teachers looks like. Is that accurate? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Yep. So yeah, I just, I do feel like the dentist, Jody. <laughs> like, I know I'm just the necessary evil. You, I'm sure you appreciate having your cavities fixed or whatever. <laughs> Not that I'm fixing cavities, but I'm helping them to see their data and hopefully helping them to like get a current picture of what reality is. So um, yeah, the test that the, the pre-service teachers have to take on the foundations of reading, um, it just helps us to know, can they actually apply what they've learned in college to a real life situation. So that's what that is, if anyone doesn't know what that test is. So anyway, we're trying, we're trying to keep it a positive thing and, and a collective efficacy thing where I, we're trying to open up the lines of communication and just say, I wanna hear how it's going, like what do you need help with and how can we support you and what's going well. Lori, do you feel that there's agreement about the goal that you're collectively striving for? I didn't at first. Um, that's that's the big thing that I shared this last time was this is this is the goal that like we all have to have with SB 127. Um, we all have to be working towards this goal. And I think once they saw their data and realized yeah, we've got to get working on this. And some people are already showing huge growth. Um, the ones that have been kind of dragging their feet a little bit were more like, can you come help us? <laughs> so yeah, I do feel like after they saw the data, they did like buy into the goal and understand, oh, I need to, I need to start working towards this. But at first I, I don't feel like everyone was, was on board. Lori, yeah. I think that would be really hard. I like I'm have a lot of respect for you right now <laughs> listening to you try to do this because I feel like teachers have been in this uh, because of No Child Left Behind and grading schools and all of that. There's kind of been this implied competition between schools and maybe even between teachers within the same school. So and it sounds like this is happening, but changing their mindset of we are all in this together and we need to lean on each other, learn from each other. We all have strengths to bring to this. That mm -hmm. sounds like the best way to go because it's we've just been trained to compete, if that makes sense. Yeah, it it has been a big shift I think in their mindset and I'm I don't know that I have everyone in that <laughs> shift yet but I do feel like a couple of them are starting to be like yeah we can work with them we could help them and and starting to have this um yeah that growth collective mindset it's a big goal yeah well I'm also thinking right again related to like the the second point that we put down is you highlighting like hey I'm going to bring all of this to the table, right? I'm here to help. I've got this at my, you know, back. I can provide you with these things. I can do this, like being really supportive of them. And then at the same time, like helping them identify even like, hey, like you've been doing this really well. Like, look at all this you have to get them in this mindset of like, oh yeah, we like, this is a big problem. 
right? And it sounds like it's a hard solution and a lot to, to work for. But I think identifying and building up those like, well, what do we, what do we got, right? Like, what are we working with? And, and you know, build that excitement up to say, oh, like, I've got this. I know about this, right? And you're like, oh, this is so awesome, right? We can start writing these down and just identifying everything that we have, right? Right. I did have each of them do a self-assessment and I took all of the literacy competencies and put it in Qualtrics and I just said, how are you doing? Like, and, and I just wanted to know, like, what do you need help with? Do you need help with change management? Do you need help with professional development? Do you need help with incorporating writing? Like, what do you need help with? And so I, I'm hoping that that's helpful for them to, to celebrate what they're doing well and be like, oh, I just need help with these three things. And then it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, from, from, no, go for it, Dan. I was just going to say, uh, like, a, a consistency that I notice across um, our positions at the state level is that we have uh, this opportunity that Lori also mentioned to kind of leverage um, high flyers. Lori, I think you call them bright lights or bright spots um, mm -hmm. in, uh, like, across our community as, a, as opposed to, to the stick approach, which is like punitive consequences for those at the bottom. Um, and, and I think one key component to this that, that we talk about in our, our time last time is also that it's database high flyers. It's not just the people that are speaking the loudest, but it's like we have this data set that we have agreed like aligns with the goal that, that our community has in mind. And so in this, this particular space, we have like these these people within our community or these systems within our community that we can turn to for some promising practice. Um, and it, it's interesting, both in the example you mentioned, Laurie, as well as others that we've heard across these workshops, how that that is a consistent application of, of these ideas to our work. No, I mean, Nate, that's awesome. I think that is something that you all can leverage as a huge asset. You have a broad look across a very large population. So it's very likely that something is going well in every area. And you can say, like, I'm imagining it's like, cool, here's what we can do. We can help connect. We can make sure that we have you, we can connect you with someone who's strong in every single area that we want to be strong in. So you can essentially provide the expertise and support via all these bright lights around the state. So it looks like no breakouts for us. Um, we, it, so unless- Patrick, I, I think somehow the switch I, I don't know if it's because I'm on my iPad or what the deal is. I, I've facilitated breakout sessions a hundred times from my iPad, but uh, without ending the meeting, I don't think I'll be able to turn it on. Yeah. So I think based on if people are willing, we're a smallish group, it's not perfect, but moving forward and allowing a few, you know, more share out of examples, um, we'll switch, we'll look at another scenario. Um, I think we'll just kind of move forward and, and try to be respectful and, uh, and, and don't hold back. I mean, this is a, uh, I know a, a really from the past meetings, a lot of you are bringing all sorts of interesting examples. Please we'll share a few of these, talk them through, and, and then we'll just go from there. So, uh, thank you, Lori. That was really interesting. Uh, Corey, were you raising your hand? Or? I was just going to say. Sorry, that's easier. <laughs> but before we start, Corey, okay. uh, Lori, was that helpful? Do you feel helped? Is there anything else that you could um, use from the group while you're here? I think it's good to just talk through it. Um, I just, I the questions were super helpful to me. Um, just thinking through what other assets do we have? So like I've been trying to contact people outside of our state who are doing this already. So, so thinking about that anyway, but the, the questions were super helpful to me. 
All right. I just wanted to make sure that Lori, Lori was fully taken care of. All right, Corey, go for it. Okay. So we, in the program that I work with, we work with a, a small set of online providers and, or, you know, schools that provide online courses. And at the end of the year, we take all of their completion data and we're required to assess whether they have a minimum level of completion data or you know completion course completion to remain in our program now over the past few years we've gone through a translation process whereby those providers were reporting in one system and and they're required to now report in another system so that's a learning curve for them one of our providers was particularly challenged and they didn't meet that benchmark to remain in the system. But they can show us in that old system that they have an appropriate rate of passing. So there's that data reliability issue. You know, can we rely on this new data to kick someone out of a program? How just, how valid is that? But, you know, as we've learned here, or as similar to in other areas or other programs, we do have high flyers. So that's, that's been our strategy to connect them up with those high flyers. We have our high flyers publish best practices so that we can share. And we also have them work together with our providers to, you know, bring these, um, Re the reports up, but um, there was an additional thing that I just wanted to mention, which was the outcome of your last meeting. When we went forward with publishing or we're moving towards publishing our annual report on providers. So in years past, we just reported out statutory data and it can look good, it can look bad, but what we really focused on this year is having our providers, we asked them to look at the assets they bring to the table and tell us how they are producing these good outcomes so that we can present them in an asset-based asset manner. So that was very helpful and very timely for us. So just wanted to say that. And I was actually thinking about bringing up the same example that those online reports and then we also discovered that they were entering their data into the system wrong and so we are able to work with them on that so you changed the way you reported it or well, that's that's great yeah and we basically put the two systems together and include a blurb from them where they talk to us about their you know, they're the assets they're bringing to the table to bring the good results they're bringing. And how did the, um, how was that received? Did you get feedback? Did you notice a difference? And yes, yes. The providers that so far have completed that and have rewritten their, what was earlier just a short blurb about you know, we guarantee this sort of teacher contact when we do this, you know, it was very um, weak. It wasn't emphasizing assets. They really did come forward with a, a beautiful statement of what their assets, their individual assets are. That's fantastic. I mean, I think there's nothing better than having these opportunities to collectively um, have some time in this series to reflect and sort of frame and add language. Um, but the real outcome is actually implementation in the real world. <laughs> and it sounds like that's a, a really powerful example, Corey. Okay, so the dogs are hearing each other. That's nice. Any others that would like to share? Um, again, this is um, 
also an opportunity to not just share successes, but if, you know, we have this wonderful group of people, if you have problems of practice, like maybe you're grappling with something right now, um, you could share with us and, and the group could perhaps have some ideas for you, so. Okay. Mine's a little different. Um, Nate and I actually just talked about this um, a week ago. Uh, mine is more like lack of data um, and really trying hard to obtain some some good data. Not like, I don't mean good as in like positive, like fair amount, like, right? Like enough to work with to actually use it to, to have any kind of conclusion at all based off of what it is um and terry and i have been working together on some of this um she's pem health but like we have kind of the similar problem of having a, a lack of good data in our content um that helps drive what we do and what we want to do um we're like we have some assumptions you know we have like sharp survey is a national survey that's done in every school from elementary to high school but it doesn't really help us with practice, like of what's happening. Um, it tells us what kids are doing, but it doesn't tell us what's happening in a classroom or that could be preventing it or if the prevention that we're doing is working. Um, again, like we can draw loose conclusions, just nothing solid. So we're working, we've been this year, really have a, a consorted effort together of really encouraging our teachers to to use data in their classroom practices um, and the importance of why they need to that we're core subjects we need to act like it for one um, and using data is part of that um, so there's like so i mean if i was go through your questions right like my goal is to to support our teachers in understanding the importance of having data at all and why it's so important that that data informs our decisions, right? We look at like PCBL, we look at HQI, like all, everything. We use the data to adapt our instruction. We use the data to, to find the, what we need, we, to know what the students need. Um, so there's, there's my big um, hope and, and aspiration out of all of this. If anyone has some help, I would take the help. Jody, if you could uh, magically have like some data, what, what what's like your top priority? Like, what would you? What do you wish you had? What's your wish list? Data wish list right now. Um, I would love to know, like, have something that shows me that like the achievement of of the core standards. Like, are this are we getting through them? Like, how how much are we achieving them? And again, like. I'm, my my main focus is health here. PE Terry has PE, but we have again a similar problem, and and we have very similar teachers. Um, a good portion of our teachers teach both, right? So it's we're we're talking to similar humans um, when when we have this discussion. But I want to know, at, like, what was our success rate of of what's actually being taught? Um, health has has pretty new standards. We're two years into implementation of our standards. I want to know how are we doing? Are they, are are we getting through them? Are they working? Are we seeing benefit? Um, so that that'd be my big ask. That'd be my dream to know to know what the students are are learning. I would um, like to know that they're learning instead of just playing games. What is their learning curve? And in elementary too. Hey, Jody so, and Harry, would you be able to do something like Lori did and send out something through Qualtrics, just get getting basic information? Um, so we, we have used some survey tools um, with so far very limited responses. Like we're, we get great responses from like some of your, who you would expect to have give you some some feedback. Um, you know, our, our great big Wasatch Front friends, they're really good at answering. Beyond that, it's a lot trickier and less, less response. So if you have, if you have help, Kimberly, I would, I would take some help. So Jody, one thing that, that, that I think about is, um, I'm thinking back to 
like when a few years ago when we started our PCBL implementation um, in earnest uh, across the state, we released a needs assessment that was focused on the application of, of the, the kind of items in our PCBL framework to communities. Um, and then those communities kind of uh, administered those assessments internally. And, and I know that there's, <laughs> uh, there's some, like this isn't a perfect circumstance, but if you, you know, you and I have talked about the, the possibility of building a health and or PE framework, but if you have like that set of goals that Patrick and Jeremy were talking about that the community is, is behind and like these things are the focus, like doing a needs assessment associated with, with those goals, um, like asking communities to do that, even if you didn't get everyone to buy in, like you would have a set of uniform and, and reasonably reliable data that, that you could use to make some decisions on. And it could even be like a, a kind of yearly cadence such that like this was data that came in every year. Um, if you like having grants <laughs> is, is worthwhile it, in part because of that, you can uh, motivate people to do the needs assessment based on money. Um, and so I, like, I also wonder about your needs assessment for Title IV-A. Maybe there's a way to build that in. It's, a, it's every three years, it's not every year, so it's not perfect, but those are, are two wonders I have from other systems that, that we've had in place. And to connect some dots, um... Jody and Terry, I think, uh, especially with collecting data, there's it gets back to what we were talking about with 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 Lori and and Corey is the um, is there a clarity of goal or purpose? Um, I mean, I know if I'm sent a random survey and I don't really understand why or who's using it for what purpose, the odds of me filling it out are pretty small. Um, I think that's human nature. But again, part of this actionability is, you know, do the do the health or, or PE teachers see a value? Do they see that this, you know, is worthwhile, that they that they they stand to benefit from participating? I mean, and some of this is about building that community with shared vision. Um, and then it gets back to that if you have a shared vision. I mean, uh, I think Lori's first example is that without a, a a vision or goal, it can seem like the data is punitive. I'm just going to bring some things and say what's you're doing bad at, and then you know I don't really want to listen to that, or you know I have maybe reasons, or but if we agree on a goal and we want to see if we're making progress to that goal, then there's a question of how collectively are we going to do this? And then there's, I think, a really open question. An individual teacher might be like, well, I feel fine. I'm like, I'm good. You know, I don't need to know if other teachers are meeting their goal. I'm, I'll just focus on what I'm doing, right? So how do you elevate that into a more shared uh, vision of more shared responsibility? Yeah. And, and yeah, I think like in the 100%, like, yes, yes, 100%. And I think in my time that I've been here, I've been here, you know, five and a half years, and I see a huge improvement in the engagement back, um, like are my the mailing list and like some of the structures that we've put in place to engage with teachers. Um, I, I see huge improvements and huge trust, like, honestly, like, that's the big one, like huge amounts of trust have been have improved. Um, so we're getting there. Um, yes, Nate, I see that formative assessments. Um, we're, and we're creating like a hub and we have all these things that are in place. So I, and what Nate and I were talking about, you know, last week is like, we're getting there, we're getting there, but like, this is not something that I'd be like, I'm going to implement this and tomorrow I'm going to have beautiful data. Um, it's a very long-term goal to have beautiful data. And Jody, it might be looking at what we do have already. So like you've got the SHARP survey, which gives you some indications. Mm -hmm. You have that annual course standard survey, which gives you some indications. So like leveraging what we have, and then I do think there's opportunity for formative assessment items in your guys' space to be able to have LEA conversations around, well, how are kids, what, you, what I hear you wanting to know is your impact, knowing the impact and how you figure that out. 
And I, I think we've got some pieces that tell us like our kids getting enough minutes of exercise, our kids having developing healthy habits, do kids have ways to handle stress management, whatever the issues might be, and then thinking about, okay, well, our SHARP survey or our core standard survey says this, how might we support the field in addressing those areas of concern that you guys I've never thought about putting them together of, of and looking at them like overlapping. That's cool. That's a cool idea. I like that. And you might have other ones. I, those are just two I know from working yeah. with you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And uh, yeah, at the beginning, I'm, I 100% will use the Sharp survey. It just has limits too. But comparing it with the core standard one might be a really cool leverage. I like it. I mean, I also think like you've already touched on this. You have great read rates and trust is building. So like that's that's a really hard asset to build, right? Um, and I would think that's number one. And, you know, as Patrick was saying, like, what's the small next step you can take to build towards what you're looking for with that group? And, you know, even if they're just reading it, right, the you showing off what you're doing, you talking about, you know, this is what we're, we're, we're after, right? We want to make it easy to understand what processes and what, you know, classroom activities are driving better health in students, which I'd imagine every one of those teachers wants. That's why they're in the career they are. So. Yeah, and so this, you know, I think the much like a, a Jen's comment is like, you know, taking stock, this is totally the whole asset framework. What do you have? And even if the individual pieces are not ideal, maybe in combination you can get you know more you know the sum being more than the parts and also just taking stock you know I, I it was worth I thought putting in the text it sounds like high read rates and trust is an asset that you've currently developed in your time and so that just acknowledging that and having that as a place to build off of that's really you know um I think an important step as well uh, Jeremy also asked, and I wanted to kind of circle back, I think, and then we can sort of switch to a, the second scenario, but um, did has anyone had, um, what did you say, uh, yeah, high response rates from large surveys? Has, has anyone in your experience had a, some successes in that that, you know, maybe we could share? We had 6,000 educators respond to a reading survey we did several years ago, and then our engagement educator survey, we got 11,000. So um, some of that might be. Uh, What's the denominator <laughs> on that? <laughs> 6,000 right. out of. I, yeah, right. I think it was, we leveraged our community. So our, our like directors to say, hey, here's why we're doing this. We we're all trying to address a common problem, help us get the word out. We asked them to directly send it to teachers to try and but we brought them in. We didn't just send the survey. Oftentimes in our work, we just send a survey and hope people fill it out. But we had discussions for months. We had focus groups that then led to the survey. Um, and so it really was all of us wanting to understand the current reality to kind of plan the future um, needs, but needed to understand the landscape. And so, and I, the engagement survey, Jody and, and Terry, Cami might have some strategies of how she did. She was relentless with, harassing the LEAs who hadn't responded and things like that. Um, and it is required by law. Yours would not be required by law. So <laughs> some of that, like hers, is a, a law requirement. But the one we did for reading was truly we worked um, with the community to say, we need to understand how to meet your needs. And to do that, we need to know where our teachers are. And we need your help in getting the word out to be able to investigate that. And that's the data we've continued to use to get 20 million more dollars in, in reading is our teachers don't feel confident in teaching reading. Um, and we have the data to support that, but it really took the LEAs understanding why we were asking what we were asking and how it was gonna be used um, to benefit them in the long run. No, it's really powerful. Again, I wanna underscore this idea of like asset-based data tied to purpose. And in this case, to ensure that there was a common, you know, you put in the 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 work into building that community of understanding the common purpose that resulted in this um, happening at the high numbers that you described. So 
linking to purpose is really uh i think an underscored theme um what is this uh 1300 responses full room yeah there's nothing like um a live captive audience <laughs> when they're in the room all right fill it out Very now few of those were teachers though like <laughs> no it's good yeah no, I, I i mean i i i really believe that also um in the context of if you're talking about the purpose and goals and now build up to that survey you know like we're hearing out that's probably not just a higher response rate but actually higher quality responses so i think that that's really important all right um thank you with your patience and our inability to do breakouts um i'm going to unless they've taken away my ability to share screen um well it'll, it'll be very similar so i can talk through it so it's just a different style scenario right so this first time we're talking about data right you don't have the data you want you're you don't you're not getting it but this other side is cool you have some data right um you found something whether that be an insight a uh, bright light right uh you know whatever you have made some sort of conclusion based on data you've seen and so now uh, you know, very similar scenario is that, cool, well, what do we do with it now, right? So um, I also put a bunch of other stuff. So you can also have gained or lost, uh, you know, an asset, right? You have an extra million dollars in funding or you lost a million dollars in funding, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, everyone would, would love that suitcase. Um, you gain new insight, learn something new, made a new discovery. Right. So just think about these in your own work. Um, you know, what 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 has been happening? And then I think there's a third one, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, so one of your schools, districts, or teachers, right, outperformed and they just made substantial gains, or um they just underperformed, or you lost them, they moved to a new state. These are all uh scenarios that are gonna happen, right? And so how do we approach that um from asset-based action, right? things are going to happen, but well, what can we do? What, what now new goal do we have, right? If you have that million dollars in funding, you might say, well, I want to be able to spend this and make it the most productive, you know, use of that money as possible. If you lost it, right? Well, now you maybe you want to keep the good things that you had going with that funding, but you now have less to work with, right? So you're going to have to think about well, what did we learn? What are all the resources that I gained that I can now leverage to keep that up, right? Uh, same with discoveries, right? You're learning something new. How do you implement? Um, and same with 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 people moving or outperformers. You have those like what we talked about before. We can have bright lights become examples and exemplars and share out best practices, right? But also sometimes we're going to um lose star performers they're going to move uh somewhere else well you know i always think of that as like well great now there's a new there's a new place where somebody can step up right so all of these are scenarios i just wanted to you know brainstorm up again right like where are you at just to you can share out something that's going on in your own personal um work and we can think about what is actually asset-based action look like um, in that scenario. So I'll go ahead and open it up. And yeah, or if you have something totally different that you want to talk about, that, that we could talk asset-based action, that's good too. Well, one thing I just thought about is if we do have someone who makes a great gain or even a great loss, you need to sit down with them and say, okay, what changed? What was different? Because it should be more than just a simple thing or a major thing. I may, Who knows? Maybe they did a, made a simple change. But you've got to look back and evaluate and find out what exactly happened here. What's going on? Yeah, and, and I think it's a really powerful thing to, to frame 
the idea of a, you know, there are losses or, you know, hey, it didn't go so well. That is an asset, right? Because it is something you can learn from. And especially at your level, right? It's, you can uh, inform people across the state on these new learnings. Why, you know, hey, performance just went down and this is why that happened, right? Um, that's now an asset that everyone can learn from, right? Uh, it looks like um, uh, Jody volunteered Etiana to talk about uh, stronger connections. Um, if uh, and Jody said she would talk about it if you are not able to, Etiana. Yes. So our Title Four Part A every year gets um, almost six million dollars, um, but this past year. It was an additional subgrant under that Title IV A called the Stronger Connections Grant that gave Utah just about over five million extra dollars than we normally get. And right now we're expecting a little bit more money from our normal grant for next year. So that is a big asset uh, for the state. Um, this subgrant, the Stronger Connections Grant, specifically is for safe and healthy students uh, area of it. So that I and it's a competitive grant so that LEAs can um, either expand their existing projects or start a new project for the next couple of years to help their students, whether it's with mental health, uh, substance abuse. Um, it's a, we have a very wide range of things that they can do with the fund. So that's very exciting setting up um, that grant for them to say, hey, we have this really great idea, um, score it and see if we can get money to make it happen. That's great. So if I'm understanding the state is through this grant, um, got extra money than typically in a given um, a year. And so now there's an opportunity for LEAs to uh, write proposals to. Pro so do they have some sort of guidelines or is this a, a case where they can sort of innovate and try new things? A little bit of both. Um, so they do have to work off of their needs assessments that they do every three or so years already for the formulated part of the grant. Um, and the innovation part of it is, uh, do they want to start a new project and be mindful that this funding is for just the next three years? So it's um, not super long term, but they'll be able to do something maybe they weren't able to do before, or looking at the successes that they've already had with their existing funds that they receive every year, and how these funds can enhance that. Maybe they're able to um, add a new teacher or um, increase the benefits of a teacher of a project they're already doing or have some other very innovative idea. One school mentioned that they would like to put in a playground um, that doesn't exist um, for their students with the funds, for example. But they have to look at data to, to drive that decision and create a very competitive application since it this this five million dollar part of it they are competing against other schools or leas to have their application scored higher so that they receive their amount of funding and they also have thank you jody they also have to look at their stakeholder feedback that's a huge part of how they're going to get scored are they looking are they communicating with parents with teachers, with students, um, if their project is mental health based, are they talking to mental health professionals to gain a good understanding of what their needs are to justify and give evidence um, that this is the best plan that they can bring forth. Does this, uh... I mean, so you're going to have all these proposals. I'm sorry, I'm thinking back to Jody's problem, but you're going to have all these proposals that have to be data backed about, um, you know, what they believe will help in student wellness. Mm -hmm. Jody, could you use that information as survey results and data for your problem? Oh, trust me, we have included it as one of the possible high high need pieces. It is included, friends. Yes, and That's great. Uh, a big part of this is uh, 
first letting people know that this grant exists and that they have the opportunity to apply, but also constant communication with them. So that way they can not only have high quality applications for this, but going forward with Title IV, um, normal funds going on the next couple of years, which also goes back to um, PE and health and all the other areas that Jody does. So we're trying to connect all of them together and create a community that's engaged and understands that, hey, this information is good for everyone, um, but it's, it's slow. You just have to build it over time. Well, I mean, I think that's awesome. It sounds like you have already been working together to really utilize this extra funding, which is really interesting, right? Obviously with funding and applications, I mean, this is like a good general practice of, you know, hey, if we've got funding and like, and we want data, then we can ask for data if you want funding as, a, as that motivator. So I think, I, I just wanna highlight and I think what you two doing, you know, or I guess probably more of you all working together to achieve using like, oh, you got something over here? Like, how can we package that together to help the state as a whole? So I just want to applaud you all for, for doing that work. I, I know that's difficult and tricky. So Jeremy, can I uh, like make a connection to what Etiana and then also uh, more broadly Jody talked about? And that is how uh, money is a good motivator when it comes to grants. And, and so best practice with regards to setting up grants is that there are clear goals established, that um, there are these outcomes that any applicant who applies for that money needs to demonstrate what strategies they're going to use to achieve. Um, and I think that framework is one that there's opportunity for us um, in state positions to leverage in our work with with our content areas, um, whether that, that's, you know, science, whether that's SPED, whether that's like assessment um, more broadly, like from an accountability level, that, that like my experience is that in, in these areas, oftentimes we'll identify what promising practice looks like. And this often comes from research, right? Like maybe it's the science and engineering practices within science, maybe it's uh, the standards uh, of mathematical practice or the math teaching practices in math. But we don't have metrics that help us identify who the high flyers are in those um, spaces that are like explicitly connected to um, our accountability system. So oftentimes what accountability is measuring is not the same things that we're talking about uh, that we want to see in systems. And maybe they're loosely connected, uh, but they're not explicitly connected. And so if we can find ways uh, to, to kind of gather or, or develop systems-wide data connected to those things that we wanna see within our content areas. Like that, that connection to me is um, one that was kind of an aha moment as I've been thinking about your focus on goals and purpose and the way that these grant ecosystems are set up uh, with very defined goals and purpose um, that maybe there's an opportunity to take how those systems are set up and, and use it to, to adjust what we do with our communities um, connected to our purview. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. You have a lot of assets, right? One of the assets you have is you're in a grant based system. How do you leverage grants, grant writing, all that stuff to your advantage in the best way possible? So you know that that's a that's a powerful one. There's a quote by uh, uh, Demings, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. <laughs> and I think sometimes I think of that in conjunction with um, the data really is a way of operationalizing our aspirations and goals. Um, if we want students to have increased wellness or health how do we know <laughs> where are we at where do we want to be right that's this is what keeps getting us back into this like what are we working with and how can we use that to to make progress towards some agreed upon goals 
Yeah, Dem Deming is, is uh, got a lot of good quotes. He's also the same one who has the quote, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it does. <laughs> so, um, so you can't blame the system. The results is exactly what the, the system's results are exactly what they're producing. Um, so, all right. I want to be a little mindful. Some of you, I mean, first of all, I really appreciate these examples and um, the the opportunity to ask each other questions. Um, and I wanted to just open up the floor if there's other people that haven't had an opportunity to share or talk yet. Um, I just want to uh, give a little room and either you have another example that that you're working on or a question so let me just reach out to people who haven't had a chance to participate and again thank you for being patient with um the technology and uh i know that a whole group is not what we had planned but we're trying to make it work so i just want to open the floor open the door. I guess everyone's problems are totally solved. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, some good Good quiet, good wait time, but <laughs> that's totally fine. I mean, I just wanted to make sure that some of you who maybe were waiting for an opportunity to jump in, I wanted to make sure you had that space. But if everyone's good, we're good. Um, now I'll actually open it back to everyone. Any other sort of questions or comments or other projects that came about? in terms of this uh, asset-based action, which is the theme of our, our last session here. I can just say, not in terms of a, a particular action right now, or nothing existing right now, but I know that the whole asset-based approach to producing reports will stay with me forever. I will never re approach a report as I did in the past. That's really a powerful perspective. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, uh, I'll say even, I mean, Jeremy and I, after the last session, when we talked about reporting, we're reflecting on some of the reports that we produce could have improvements in terms of asset-based reporting. And, and so I think it's really been valuable to have these opportunities to step back and, and really reflect and look and take stock, you know, what's working, what's not, where's places of, of improvement. Um, asset-based action. Yeah, absolutely. Melissa and Milo. Nate is asking, um, and then also Terry has her hand up. Sure, we can share. Nate, exact, I don't know what you want us to share about them. <laughs> um, so, Melissa, my wonder is uh, if there's uh, like opportunities connected to reporting um, that you thought through with regards to the, the way that you're implementing your formative assessment items. And, and maybe other people would benefit from, from hearing about your process for the creation of them, as I, I think that not only are the rubrics that you have embedded, um, like built from a kind of asset-based perspective, but, but just the, the idea of formative assessment and the way that you have designed them um, has opportunities to be leveraged in an asset-based way. Yeah, we really did think about um, the assets of our community. We used the community to create them. So we had teachers asking us for 
uh, formative assessments because they weren't sure how, you know, what did the new standards look like? What was the expectations for teaching? Um, so this was back uh, when Ricky was here. I created a template for how we could um, create formative assessments to support teachers in understanding the rigor of the standards and the expectations of the standards. Then Ricky and Scott and I got together and we created, based off of the kind of a temple, template process, we created a model one for a sixth grade standard. Um, and then with Ricky and Scott, we got together and thought, you know, what assets do we have? We have all of these teachers who are working hard to implement the standards. We also have um, lots of support from SPED to know what to do there and also from bias and sensitivity through the assessment department of how we could support all learners to be successful. So we got together, there were 13 teams with seven on a team. Um, so one for each grade level and then for high school, one for each content area and worked together through using these groups of teachers where there was an embedded SPED person and, a, and an embedded bias and sensitivity person so that we could really create a formative assessment that teachers could use in their classroom with all students that would support all students to help them see, you know, where are my students at? What are they doing well? We embedded a rubric so that they could look and see it was an asset-based rubric saying, my student has this, or the next step, my student has this, so that they could see where is my student, where do I need to go to help them move to the next level. So these are really up to the teachers to use however they want. Um, we, we got a lot of feedback from educators and from science specialists the first year. Um, brought people back and revised them all to make them even more useful to teachers for, and we did that just the beginning of this year, end of last year. So, I mean, they're very, what I'm hearing is teachers are loving them. They're very supportive of helping them build on what their students have and grow even further. We don't keep data on them because it's totally up to the teachers to use. But anyway, that's kind of the idea behind the item creation. I can echo what Wilson was saying about the implementation. Like it really was designed for the teachers um, to be able to see where their students are at and give those the teachers the data that they would need to be able to make those asset-based um, decisions on, okay, here's where my students are at. This is where I want them to be. And they even had that rubric that was included in there so they could see, okay, this is potentially where they should be and where they need to get and hopefully give them some ideas on data that they can, uh, actionalize data that they can use to then move their students where they want them to go. Yeah, I think it's a good example. It also, we're sitting here at the state level. Um, I mean, this sort of, quote, theory of action, a sort of asset-based assessment, asset-based data leading to asset-based reporting, and then action, of course, can happen in a classroom. Uh, individual teachers can have that operating. And it sounds like what you and Melissa are describing is you created some tools, some formative assessments to really um, uh, support teachers in surfacing some of the, I mean, uh, assets that their students were showing, and also uh, in, in connection with the idea of making a clear goal, uh, Melissa pointed out that there was a question about, you know, what what do the new standards look like? What is rigor? And again, uh, assessments also serve that purpose in terms of providing sort of exemplars of this is what it looks like in fifth grade, or in this is what eighth grade you know, uh, science should, you know, this is what uh, that shared expectations for students. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the genre of, of uh, academic standards. So at your level, one up at, you know, you're, you're 
you're over the multiple LEAs and each of these LEAs have multiple teachers. And so you're providing um, sort of tools up and down the sort of system. Uh, Terry, you had your hand up earlier. Not that I wanna dominate the conversation with health and PE, but it was interesting. <laughs> It was interesting on Friday when I did a professional development down um, for Iron County. The, the first thing someone said was, so we probably heard this before, but you've repackaged it in a different way. And I said, well, I said, maybe you'll have to listen and find out if you've heard it before and it's been repackaged. But my guess is, it is not repackaged in a different way, and it's something new for you to think about. So anyway, I went on to talk about um, gathering data for students and also um, doing a better job with instruction um, and looking at the data to guide our instruction. And you could see in the whole group of PE teachers that I don't know if they had even thought about that when they were when they have their grading practices because typically in a PE realm they teach the subject give a test and their test score is the student's grade but I was teaching them that really we should be looking at the assets that students have and the goals that we have for the students and understanding um, where the students are and where we wanna take them for their learning. And I think that it's going to generate more training because I don't think they even thought about that's how they're supposed to be teaching, really, because they're teaching to give the student a grade and they're not teaching to measure learning and to to monitor the learning. I think the monitoring the learning is a whole new thought process for them. No, I think these are really, really good examples. Um, and uh I think, although we have talked about health and PE, I think what you're describing really does apply to any of the, the subject areas or disciplines. Um, and so, and also a callback to the different levels of the system. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, Corey was talking about data that was really teacher data um, as opposed to, you know, student data. But in some ways, there's parallels between all of these, which gets us back to um, kind of closing out, uh, I think, really the purpose. And we will be getting out of here um, a little bit early, but uh, this last session is really, I want to, let me present again. Um, this is being weird. There it goes. There's... Uh, Bryce Canyon again. So the I just want to remind that we've taken on a lot of themes. You know, we started very fundamentally is like, what do we mean by asset based assessment? And we talked about that in terms of sort of student thinking. But we also looked at that in terms of growth versus proficiency, um, which gets back to you know sort of what Terry was just talking about. Um, we then had in our series looking at asset-based as, uh, assessments as sort of design criteria, and like the fundamental question is that are there features that make an assessment more of an asset-based assessment? Um, and then last time we did the reporting. Uh, how do we take that data and how do we uh, represent it numerically, graphically, or in other forms? Um, this is kind of captured in, uh, these are the three virtual sessions, the um, design criteria, reporting and actions. 
And one of the things that I think has been powerful as we've gone through this is that this is really more about the system, the framework, rather than an individual component. Uh, this has been hit upon repeatedly, starting with the very first day when we're in person all together. And that is, is that it's not just the assessment that you have a box that you can check as asset based or not. It's not just the report, but it's the combination of how you're collecting that data, how you're analyzing it and reporting it, and then how you're acting upon it. And so we structured this series around those pieces. Um, and at least one way of thinking about this is what we're, call, we're calling them asset-based uh, data cycles or learning cycles based on asset-based data. And that is, is that this can apply, um, and I have it here at a kind of classroom level, but I'm very cognizant that you could replace this up and instead of students, this could be teachers. You could even have it higher to talk about data that was collected at the LEA level, you know, where you're looking at sites, not just individual teachers. So again, regardless, these cycles all have in commonality this sort of voice agency that it's really explaining their reasoning and that we're trying to avoid these sort of forced choice um, in many times when it's just a, a multiple choice, uh, which you know I like to call forced choice, is that are we really capturing the scope of the information we want, or are we kind of just trying to compliance pigeonhole things into certain bins? After that, the real goal is to look for those ways of thinking and sense making. Um, the phrase that I like to use a lot is that we're really looking at evidence of what students can do and not assumptions about what they cannot do. And again, like I said, we could replace students here with teachers. If this is teaching, uh, we're working with teachers in literacy uh, or reading, um, what is it that this teachers can do and not make assumptions of what the teachers are not, quote, able to do. And then lastly, all of this is only as good as the impact that it has, which when be characterized as, as the action. Um, there is an enormous amount of compliance data collected that often nobody ever looks at. And that's, some of this is necessary, um, but in our fields and what we really care about, what we wanted to do today is really talk about if you have a goal, a specific goal that you're trying to accomplish, then this cycle really does provide a powerful framework to take that asset-based data, analyze and report it out in a way that's actionable. And then um, that action really builds on what you're learning about how students are thinking or teachers are thinking or other specific uh, actions that can be then re-engaged, um, just-in-time supports. And I do think that this sort of supports make sense at an individual student level, a teacher level, or even an LEA level. So we're trying to think about you and your roles as uh, sitting in the State Department of Education and really uh, look at how this uh, plays through. So um, this is just uh, my summary. And what we wanted to do is provide a little bit, again, we won't be doing, I'll stop sharing. Oops. Uh, well, of course, now you can't see the questions. <laughs> They're basically the takeaway points. We wanted to actually uh, take a chance to just kind of go around. And um, I mean, in some sense, Corey already like started the ball rolling by saying that she is not, after this series, she is not, she can't look at reports the same way without looking at it from an asset based lens. And so I wanted to, again, in the spirit of, uh synthesis i've just you know spent five minutes trying to capture what we tried to accomplish and we really want to hear from you um so if any of you would like to share out your takeaways um again this is our last session but we're really excited about either things you've already 
kind of taken away or things that you plan to take away? Okay. I'll, I'll start. Um, when I kind of mentioned in the chat when Etiana was talking about stronger connections, but as we were building the, the application for stronger connections, I started going back and changing the title for application um, and really making sure that it was actionable and that the way that that they're using their data um, has an action base and that we're pulling out the assets from their data, not you know looking for gaps and deficits, which yes, we want to fix those, but what do you have in place? Anyway, so as Etiana and I were building the stronger connection one, <clears throat> we've truly pulled from things that, that have been discussed in these you know four sessions and um i went back and changed the the main application the one that's ongoing um you know because type stronger connections is a subgrant of the of the other one so um that's like the most immediate thing that like i know we're already doing um which you know is a big chunk of my job so this is great awesome yeah build off of what Jody was saying, I think even in the Stronger Connections rubric, um, we had a big focus on that stakeholder feedback, making sure they're really hearing the voice of who this is going to impact and looking at that and analyzing it, even the way the Scrum rubric is structured, it's putting, looking at their assets, they're not losing coins based off of anything they're lacking in their responses, but only gaining from that and also there's a training that will be attached to this where it puts them on an even playing field of this is what um, the type of skills you need to develop to make sure you're in writing this grant that it's successful. So really taking this is what you have and giving them every opportunity to build from there. I'm going to go backwards on that one more time, Etiana. If you're, when we were building, because we have, so like it's almost deficit, it's almost set up almost deficit framed, right? Because to even do this grant, we have to create a Utah definition of high need. Mm -hmm. And when we were building that definition, we had our safe and healthy team, right? So the counselors, the mental health specialists, the suicide prevention specialists, the substance abuse prevention specialist, all there, they were all there um, and helping us um, create this, this uh, definition for Utah. And some of the terms that you know that are, are used in some of the data is really not positive, right? We're looking at some pretty terrible topics here: homelessness, substance use, suicide. Like they're not fun things. And during that conversation, Etienne and I continually were like, "Well, that's a is there an asset based way we could word that?" And like we kept like changing the phrasing around. Um, one, to make it student focused and two, to not be quite as awful sounding um, because it, the topics are not easy, right? Like it's not easy stuff. <laughs> it, it's heavy. Right. And I think we talked a little bit about this last session and it was really insightful is because we don't always want to live in a Pollyanna world where everything's great all the time. And that's not really what asset, you know, the early very first days, like is asset based a framework for assessment is everyone gets a trophy and that absolutely not. And so it's more, I think, clear to me when you think about, do we have a shared vision? So you're talking about like student wellness. Um, and if we have a shared vision of what we want to achieve as a goal, then the fact that taking into account factors that are in some sense uh, obstacles towards that vision of wellness, um, you know, substance abuse or, or violence, suicide, you know, those are not what we're looking for goal wise, but we're trying to mitigate that and uh, support that. So I like the way that you have been really thoughtful about framing this. And again, not by shying away with like, well, we're just not going to mention anything difficult or challenging. You're dealing with real challenges. Let's be honest about that. But let's frame it in a way that's more uh, positive goal oriented. Other takeaways?
Yeah, Maslow before Bloom. Oh, we've we've got all sorts of great quotes coming this way. I think one of the things for me, I've always kind of sometimes been bothered when I hear teachers say, "Well, my students can't do that." Yeah, yours can do it in your classroom, but you can't. But mine can't. Mm -hmm. it's like, why? Like, it doesn't. That never made sense. And this kind of gives language and has provided the viewpoint that on how we can potentially work to better that that issue with with teachers and um, help them to hopefully identify what students can do and then let's get them to where we want them to be based off of that so I like that oh absolutely <laughs> kids got game i love it all right we have one more I can share just a little bit from the prevention perspective where um, previous work has been um, collecting, try to get data and say, what's the problem? And a lot of like behavior problem, discipline problems, right? Around that. So I think the new framework with the re uh, restored practice work and working, um, and before was looking at the risk, what are the risk factor that the youth has so that we can work. So now is the framework, what are the protective factor? What are the relationship and restore practice work that are there? And then trying to frame in a way. So one is the positive a way of framing, um, promoting um, protective factor for our youth is one thing. And then um, associate with the data to how to collect data to measure those changes in terms of positive behavior, in terms of uh, creating more positive factors for our youth so that they can try at the, uh, at the school level, at the individual level. So the framework is there. I think of the technicality of that um, need to work on, but but do you see what's the the framework on the prevention is, is in that way? So I just wanna share that with the group here, thanks. Thank you. The, uh, I I want to say personally, um, I don't, I didn't have a lot of experience, but I've uh, in some of the school prevention issues and um, just being part of this series and having these conversations, I've learned so much, um, and I'm just really interested. In fact, I recall you saying the very first day is that this asset based approach is something that the field has been trying to do for for many years. Um, and so I think, again, this is just really powerful. So um, I'm going to uh, uh, slideshow this, bring us home. Um, Nate, I'm sensitive to the fact that you uh, um, have to leave in a couple minutes. Is there any last words? And then I'm going to really just close out. I'm going to put a link to the um, uh, right now. Uh, why is that being weird? Everyone in the meeting. The, um, the survey. Um, we know that this isn't going to, this is the end, but we still really always value collecting data. What? So when you're reflecting back, we ask about this session, but really comments about this series as a whole. Thank you for those who shared out um, uh, the um, sort of next steps and takeaways for you. It was really powerful. And then um, really, thank you so much. Uh, Nate, did you want to say a last word in the last two minutes before you take off? Yeah, that'd be great, Patrick. I appreciate it. Um, the, the big thing, um, that I want to say, and like I could go on for a long time about the takeaways that I had. I put some of them in the chat, but just a huge thank you to uh, Patrick and Jeremy. Uh, if we could do a visual representation of our thank you, feel free to come off mute. You could also do an auditory. Thank you for unsharing your screen. Um, like it's been a pleasure to get to collaborate with you on uh, kind of sharing our vision with with what our team, our STEM Plus team, set as a goal that we thought would also benefit. Um, the entire agency. So we are really appreciative of, of those um, within the STEM Plus team for participating, within teaching and learning for participating, with, across the agency for participating. Um, so, so thank you so much for making that participation possible across contexts for, for their work. Thank you for 
um, aligning your uh, kind of professional learning experiences with uh, the goals that we had and the purpose that we had for these um, uh, workshops. And then also for, for creating a bridge between the work that we did last year and this more specific work that we did this year. Um, it was a, a pleasure, privilege, and an honor to get to collaborate with you all. Um, and uh, thanks so much for your time. For, for everyone, the only other thing that I wanna mention is that um, we'll continue to do quarterly implementation uh, check-ins. They'll be the same as we did last year. It'll be 30 minute meetings in which we'll kind of capture the ways that we have implemented uh, the um, experiences and the insights from, from within this workshop. And so uh, I look forward to seeing everyone uh, again before too long on those experiences. And thanks so much for taking the time to fill out um, the survey before you peace out. Thanks everyone, appreciate you. Thanks for inviting us, Nate. Yeah, and, and I know Patrick it's, has said this, but it's been a pleasure to get to know all of you. Um, I've learned a lot from hearing your perspectives. And so I just wanna say thank you very much back to you all for participating and for uh, letting us engage with you. Absolutely. And thank you. Don't hesitate to reach out to us with follow-up questions. We always love a good win. Um, we're excited to hear about how that um, Stronger Connections uh, grant goes. That sounds very exciting. And all of you on your individual projects Corey, I'm sure you're going to get all those teachers just, you know, at the highest levels. It's perfect. Everyone's going to be a shining star. So, um, all right. I, I think we are going to call it. Uh, thank you so much. Again, the link, did that work? Did anyone try to open it? Um, we always appreciate feedback and thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really been a true pleasure. We don't do a lot of multidisciplinary work. We're more math focused and this was really a unique and special treat for us to really hear all the different perspectives. And it really validated, I think, some of the work we're doing in mathematics in a broader context. So with that, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, we did it, Jeremy. <laughs> you're muted if you're saying something. It's okay, I was just saying, yep, awesome. All and right. Talk to you later.